I don't, I don't want to burn it down. I want to strengthen and improve democracy when it's weak or when it's fraying. I want to have the debate about how do we make this democracy stronger and better. I think the free and actual anarcho-capitalistic free market is the ultimate democracy because you're actually voting with your dollar, buying and selling what to create. And in this hypothetical world, admittedly, where property cannot be violated against, wealth creation would be maximized. So we've, we've limited scarcity. We've limited the things to fight over. And if property can't be violated, like this is the great hope of Bitcoin, you can't take my shit, so why be violent? There's no carrot to the act of violence or, or coercion. So people, but that itself is not exactly true because even Jameson Lop has a GitHub that lists all the people who have had their Bitcoin violated. Oh, you through absolutely the threat of can. So you, you can, you can. But if you hold it properly, as I know you hold yours properly, it's a pretty low attack surface, right? Of course, but it doesn't get rid of it. I'm not. I'm not. By but, the way, but, but even, but even, but even with that, that's only that's the only one form of property. We don't live with a single form of property that is Bitcoin. So let's talk about what property I have. I have Bitcoin. I have my house. I have my car. I have my clothes. I have the properties within the property within my house. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you come to my house, you can't get my Bitcoin because I'm super smart and my keys are globally distributed. You can you can hold a gun to my head and make threats for. Other things, you can take my TV, you can take my car. So it doesn't eliminate violence. It just eliminates what people can steal from. It just changes what people can steal from you. And I don't think we eliminate violence. So let me be clear. And, and, and sorry, sorry, let me add to that. Also, we know in every single society, when people are desperate, when people are hungry, they will resort to violence, mm-hmm. right? That's just, this is why there's the big fear of, of food scarcity right now. Right. Because we are going to see revolutions we're going to see protests when people are desperate they will attack the great thing about western liberal democracies if we build a society that looks after the weakest it looks after the poorest like we do our best to try and protect them i'm not saying this worked perfectly but we do our best in the uk there are people who live in relative poverty but people don't die of starvation mm-hmm. in the uk and even if even if the welfare doesn't support them we have the voluntary organization of food banks that that do support people mm-hmm. Now, my travel around the world, I've been to places that has real food scarcity and doesn't have a societal structure that protects the poorest, and they are violent places. Mm -hmm. Venezuela is a violent place. People will kill you because they're desperate and they're hungry. Mm -hmm. If we have no, if we go to pure property rights, we will have people who have not been able to get on the economic ladder, but they don't have a support structure, and they will, they will enact violence upon people and they will kill people. Because Bitcoin is not the only property, so there is other shit you can steal. So you can you can steal a TV to sell to to get some Bitcoin to feed your family. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't get rid of that. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. Um, I, I want to be clear that people get real hung up on this, and it's like it's black or white. Does Bitcoin end war or does war continue? It's like it's not about that. It's yeah. does it reduce the incentives overall to violence? Therefore, limiting the scope, duration, and severity of violence in the world. That, I would argue, very strongly in favor of. Perhaps. Well, again, if we're talking about government's purpose being property, so we're outsourcing the defense of our property to the government. That's all we're doing, actually. We just currently don't have much leverage at the negotiating table in dealing with the pricing of that security. I think Bitcoin gives us a much more cost-effective and high integrity assurance of our property rights than government ever can. So the only thing, so it's not absolute, Yeah, I want to say. The one thing I am absolute on, where you could attack me, is that I, you know, freedom maximalism. I'm an absolutist on freedom. I think even freedom itself, the concept is self-regulating. The should is everyone should seek to maximize their own freedom, their own purchasing power, their own optionality. But they should do that within the bounds of other people's private property rights. Right. The, the, I think that creates not only the best individual outcomes, but also the best collective outcome. And by collective, I mean aggregate wealth creation for the world, which means the, the least amount of scarcity, least amount of things to fight over, and the, the smallest carrot for fighting over anything in the first place if you can't take my stuff. Now, I understand your argument. Bitcoin is not physical reality. It does not secure your property rights in tables and chairs and cars and whatnot. But the fact that you have an option and recourse to a form of wealth that should you be 
uh, coming into coercive circumstances, you can at least move your wealth into something like Bitcoin and be very mobile. That gives individuals a lot of optionality to reconfigure themselves in a way that protects themselves from violence. And I agree. I mean, we've seen those case studies of people who have fled Ukraine with mm -hmm. their Bitcoin, and right. that's been their escape valve. As I said at the start, I always think of, I'm always trying to look at the implications in the journey. I completely agree with you. Bitcoin changes the logic of violence. Mm -hmm. First interview ever did, I think yeah, we discussed that. I did too, yeah. But I also want to know, what does what is the net impact on the society we live in? And I know we've discussed what is society, but let's just imagine a Bitcoin society in the UK. Within the, It's easy to do because we're mm -hmm. an island, a little mm -hmm. tiny island. And it's a breakdown of the state. They can't take anything, so, so we don't have a state. Yes, we've changed the logic of violence. But what has the net impact of society been? Have we moved to something which is safer or more dangerous? Have we moved to something like without structure has become more chaotic and disorganized? Have we created a different form of wealth disparity between the haves and the haves not? Have we created dangerous, you know, have we ghettoized large parts of the country? Like what, like I try and think of the net impact. I, I don't see it through rose tinted glasses. And I sometimes feel like it's a bit like SimCity. When you play SimCity, you can design the perfect world because you lay the roads where you want them, put the buildings where you want them. I just, I think it's very easy for, a, for anyone to look at the society and, and look at where we are now and break down all the ills and the problems, but, but you can't, Words, words. All you can do with words is create a, a, a utopia. You, you don't know the reality of what's going to happen, and it might, you know, what, it might fucking suck. It might be like Venezuela, and it might be like Bitcoiners in their citadels with a bunch of dude with guns patrolling and protecting them, mm -hmm. and then outside of that, it's a bunch of poor people fighting and murdering and killing each other. And basically, it might just end up like being a, like a total shithole. <laughs> well, look, and to answer your question. It's like on what time horizon? If it's over two decades, I would completely agree. Things could get very messy. This is why I always talk about the sovereign individual. It's like these transformations from one age into another, they're not fucking clean and beautiful and you just like shift into a utopia. Typically, there's a destruction, right? There's an implosion yeah. of the existing structure. Chaos ensues because for whatever, even in a pure tyrannical society, there's a lot of stability inside of that hierarchy, right? There's predictability, you know, you know what this guy does and what uniform this guy is wearing, like you can kind of get on in the world. But when all that falls apart, when say the Soviet Union collapses, like people are lost, right? They're doing the 40 years in the proverbial desert. We could be going into something like that. But to blame that on Bitcoin, I think is, is short-sighted. I'm not blaming it on Bitcoin. I'm not saying you are, but I'm yeah. saying, I think it, that narrative will be pushed like, should we actually get into the situation where states, their insolvency is being uh, realized, let's say? They've been able to um, kick the can on insolvency through inflation, through taxation, all of these methods. Bitcoin becomes like this forcing function of honesty on all businesses, all individuals. Mm -hmm. The state's the most insolvent, upside down business in the world. So to see it start to crack up in the emergence of Bitcoin, I think people will assign blame on the Bitcoin, somewhat rightfully so, right? It's like, yeah, you gave people an alternative to a stronger, more cost-effective property right. It's bankrupting the existing business of property rights. And in that transformation, yeah, things are going to get messy, potentially, like no one knows, by the way. So I'm not, I'm not saying what I have to say about it is gospel. And indeed, what I said to you earlier, it's like, I'm, I'm disheartened. I've see, I see the pollution of our money, like the debasement of our money is like, the debasement of our psychology, the debasement of our culture. So I think we're going to go through this whole painful stage of like realizing how much bullshit we actually live in before we start to hopefully hit a rock bottom and rebuild um, a society that's premised more on volition, like mutual voluntary exchange, rather than coercion. I think the coercion itself is, again, this like dissolving agent in human affairs. Um perpetrating the business cycle and perpetrating my theoretical um, boom and bust cycle. Yeah, there's one other thing here that I'm going to talk to Tira Demeester about this. Ah, we're talking to him as well. He's got a great paper that he wrote like in 2010. And he described when you inflate the currency supply, you're actually creating more imaginary goods 
So it's like, it's an actual lie, right? You're deceiving people into believing there's more stuff in the world. So that's what creates that euphoric, you know, roaring 20s style economic boom, but that always ends up in a catastrophic hangover. You should talk to um, Jeff Booth about that as well, because he talks about that in, uh, uh, with regards to like money misinformation. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So that, the thesis roughly is that it is a deception. It's an actual deception baked into this technology we use in our minds called money. And I think there are psychological implications of corrupting or debasing that money on us that we ourselves don't quite understand yet. And I get this from, just go read about hyperinflations. There's a book. Dude, I've read My Money Dies. So you know. I know. And I think we just as a species discount how severely the technologies we use impact and shape who we are. Because yeah. that's ultimately what we're talking about here, right? It's a transformation in technology transform transforming us. I, I, I consider hyperinflation as, as like war. It's as destructive as war. It's a psychological breakdown too, though, because you yeah. lose your grip with reality. If there's hyperinflation, like how, imagine how much anxiety is induced by that. All of a sudden, your scope of human cooperation goes from 8 billion people when a currency is functional. It contracts to like, your family, dude. I, you can't I, trust anybody. I, 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 I'm, I'm literally with you on that. You know, we have a, a very similar job, and we have contracts with sponsors, right? Mm -hmm. I'm discussing multi-year sponsorship contracts, and I'm now adding inflation clauses in there in preparation wow. for yep. this. So I'm preparing for the the, the radical repricing. Mm -hmm of goods and services that affect my life. Mm -hmm. That is my version of going around the supermarket and repricing things. Mm -hmm. A very limited version of that. But it's, it is that consideration in that, <clears throat> I mean, we're at whatever, 7% inflation, which is really probably 15%. Mm -hmm. But if I price a three-year contract and we suddenly have 15% inflation, I fucked myself. Absolutely. So I get it. Like, yeah. All this stuff, by the way, I'm with you. You know, some people I'm, listen and, and they will be like, um, they, they might think I disagree with you or think I want to keep the status quo. I, I am with you. I'm purely interested in the implications. Let, let me throw on one other thing here. So this is back to that, the dirty word fiat that I think is like actual evil. Like it's a really, really bad thing in the world we need to try to deal with. But a lot of people think it's just, oh, it's this weird form of money that you lose purchasing power if they know what it means at all. Most people don't know what the term means at all. Well, define it. Do this because I said so rather than because you want to. And behind that is a veiled threat of force always. Like, do this or else, right? So, hold on. Is, is fear evil or is, is the person who controls it evil? Well, I think it's fear-based ultimately. So the individual um, speaking the fiat over another, they're scared that the world, this person will do something adverse to their interest. So therefore, they're using force over them, right? And then the, the person complying with fiat is also doing it out of fear. It's like, well, if I don't do this, they're going to put me in jail or, you know, hurt me. So there's, it's a, it's a fear integrated into human relationships that I think is a problem. And this gets into more of the kind of, you know, we need, what did, what did Jimi Hendrix say about the, the love of power and the power of love? When the power of love conquers the love of power, we would know peace, something like that. There's this trade-off where you can make decisions out of fear or love. And I think when property is viable, you're much more likely to behave according to fiat, which is a fear-based mentality. I just want to say one other thing here. So I would say my, my, my fear of the threat of not paying tax is probably much lower than the fear of a slave on a plantation. Well, here's where I want to make the equation is that it's one thing to say, all right, fiat currency is something that debases your purchasing power. But you know what else I can do to debase your purchasing power? I can cut off your left arm. You're not going to have as much earnings potential probably for the rest of your life. Or it could cut off your leg, right? You could do something very violent and terrible to someone that would hurt their purchasing power, hurt their economic interests, hurt their ability to survive in the world going forward. Or I can do it in a less visible way and do it to a much larger group of people slowly over time. It accomplishes the same effect, right? I'm reducing people's purchasing power. I'm confiscating their wealth. I'm violating their property in a less bloody, less violent way but it's the same thing. You are stealing people's life energy, whether you're perpetrating actual physical violence or you're just confiscating their purchasing power. 